and the greater reality is everybody was born to do something, mm. right? And when you know what that thing is and you do it to the best of your ability, you change your relationship to time and space. Once you get a taste of who you are, then what that does is affect you on a genetic level because who we are is encoded in our DNA. The process has been hidden from us and then erased. And as a consequence, we find ourselves wondering why everybody else is passing us by and we appear to be stuck, not moving. Because the music carried a message that helped to, to uh, expand our consciousness. Those who benefit from keeping us functioning on a subservient level and being comfortable with that had to undo that, that progress. We're no longer eating food. We're eating ultra-processed commodities that's passed on to us as food. Was Beethoven black? Uh, United States is not a democracy, uh, never was. United States is a slaveocracy built on the foundation of death and destruction. Fear and God can't occupy the same space. Fear is the absence of God. What's up, tribe? Welcome to another episode of Young, Black, and Vegan. I'm your host, Keith Terrell. Today, we are at Eat Life in Washington, D.C., and I have a very, very special guest. My next guest is an author, a cultural historian, an artist, and a memory recovery specialist. He is the founder and director of IKG Resources and has devoted more than 40 years to researching Egyptian history, science, philosophy, and culture. He is the first African-American to fund and coordinate an archeological dig in Egypt and has led over 30 archeological missions to Egypt since 2009. Now, without further ado, please welcome my brother, Dr. Anthony Broder. How Tony. you doing today? I'm good, Keith. Pleasure Tony. to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Yes, I'm, sir. Uh, honored to have you sit down here. We're going to talk about like how I even came to know who you are and just jump into all of the information I believe is very important for our community to know. We look forward to it. Yeah, so we're going to grab some food, we're going to sit down, have a good conversation, and we'll see you in a second. Can you break down what is a memory recovery specialist? A uh, memory recovery specialist is a term that I coined that speaks to, to our issues as, as people of African ancestry. Based on my studies, based on my research, um, our history has been erased, our memory has been erased, and then the erasure has been forgotten. So as a consequence of those erasures, we don't know who we are, and we're very reluctant to believe someone who attempts to bring the truth to us about who we were. And as a consequence, we find ourselves uh, stuck in time and space. And, and so I see my job is to go back and research our history. And research in this literal sense means to search, to go back and search, right? Engage in acts of Sankofa. And look at who we were before our world was turned upside down, what we've done, what we had the capacity to do, and then bring that knowledge forward into the present moment, share this information with, with those with the need to know so that those who are ready to receive this information can begin to respond to it. I mean, it echoes. Um, it, 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 it resonates within their soul, and they feel it. They respond to it. And as a consequence, they change their thinking as a result of having their memories restored, which means they now know why they're here, where they came from, what they have the capacity to do, then with armed with that knowledge, they can begin to fulfill their reason for being born. And the greater reality is everybody was born to do something, hmm. right? And when you know what that thing is and you do it to the best of your ability, you change your relationship to time and space. You change your relationship with how you move through the world and that affects everything that will happen into the future. So I see this uh, studying the past, recovering the knowledge of the past is vital to what we do today and vital to everything that we will do in the future. Right, so now, how do we find that reason that we're here and what we're t uh, here to do? Is that part of going back and studying where we came from? Well, uh, there's many different ways that people find out who they are. One is being part of a community. Uh, another is having a name because the purpose of your name should connect you to who you were, connect you to your people and help you understand what your responsibilities are in this lifetime. And then also to be part of a cultural tradition where these um, aspects of living have been maintained for generations hundreds of generations. And you'll find that those people who have those traditions in place are more successful in any society where they may find themselves anywhere in the world. So for us, looking at our situation, we can't expect to, do, to thrive in this society with our memories erased or 
with false memories. And as a consequence, you know, too many of us, too many of our people find ourselves stuck or like uh, some people say stuck on stupid mm -hmm. uh, and thinking that that's who we are and that's all we have the capacity to, to do and be. But uh, once you know who you are, once you understand what your life's purpose is, then your energies can be concentrated on fulfilling that life's purpose. And again, as I stated, that changes everything that you do in the present moment, and it also creates opportunities for you to create um, greater potential, not just for yourself, but for your offspring. So when you think about it in a larger sense, if you aren't thinking, if you aren't planning for your offspring, at least seven generations into the future, that's 150 years, you're wasting air, you're wasting time. Mm. So one of the places that we can go to get some of that information about where we come from are your writings. And that's how I actually came into contact to know who you are. Um, I believe like everything has an energy, books have Absolutely. energies. Uh, and I heard about your book, it had to be about four years ago, and it was the, the Broader Files, mm -hmm. uh, volume one. I bought it, but it sat on my shelf for <laughs> those four years. Okay. And about a month ago, what, for whatever reason, I grabbed that book and started to read it, and I couldn't put it down. And so then that led me to get your other books, uh, The Broader Files, Volume 2, mm -hmm. uh, The Nile Valley Contributions, and I watched a film on Amazon called um, Out of Darkness, mm -hmm. and I, I actually bought it from uh, Sabir Bay, the mm -hmm. DVD. And I was so compelled, it was one of the greatest things I have ever saw, and I think it's so important that we know that your writings are out there and that we dive into it because I was blown away by just the teaching. So can you kind of just talk about your writings, the purpose for writing them and what you hope people to get out of those? Sure, sure, sure. Well, my first book from the Browder File was published in 1989. So it's, it's been around for a moment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that book grew out of uh, a series of, of articles I wrote for a local uh, newspaper here in DC, the Washington Afro-American newspaper. I did a column for about two and a half years entitled From the Browder File. And um, I took 22 of those columns and expanded them, added an illustration to reinforce the, the, the concepts and ideas associated with each article and published my first book. Uh, and From the Browder File, which was published about 36 years ago, has been uh, and continue to be a runaway bestseller. It's an, it serves as an introduction to African and African-American history and culture. Short essays on a variety of subject matters uh, that speak to this whole issue of addressing the needs of people whose memories have been erased. Mm -hmm. So your testimonial here, uh, you bought the book, it sat on your shelf for four years, you read it, and it changed the way you saw yourselves. That prompted you to get the second volume of Broader Fowl Essays. That prompted you to get Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. So what you are responding to is the intent of writing and the intent of this action of recovering memories. Once you get a taste of who you are, then what that does is affect you on a genetic level because who we are is encoded in our DNA. Who we are is, is essentially who we were because we carry within us the DNA of, of all of our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, all of them live in us. And their essence has been passed down to us through our DNA. So by um, engaging in activities of remembering triggers something within that dormant DNA. Mm -hmm. And it makes it possible for your ancestors to now speak through you, right? And tell you, Keith, man, you should be you should be considering some other things. You should be preparing to make some other moves. You should be striving to free your mind. And once you free your mind, then you could do as Funkadelic said, free your behind. And once you free your behind, then it makes it possible for you to free the minds and the behinds of others. So it's a process, right? And the other reality is, is that uh, not everybody uh, can engage in the process the same way. We're all at different levels of development, right? And so what we find is, or what i found over the years doing this work, the writing and then the, the speaking that goes along with it, and then interviews that come out of people reading my writings, is that you know, we have a responsibility to wake up as many people as possible. And those who are in a position to receive the information have the consciousness to respond favorably to the information that they receive, and then uh, implement some plan of action where the, they can take what they've read, what they've internalized and put it into action is the process of knowing yourself and acting on that knowledge. Knowledge means nothing 
if you don't know what to do with it. If you can't apply it in your life and be able to see specific results from the application of that knowledge, that lets you know that it works, it lets you know how it works, and then it gives you a path to move forward and determine your destiny. So as we're talking about your operations, right now you're starting small, but you have a vision of what you can grow and, and, and become. And so part of that vision entails doing specific work, uh, progressing at a certain rate, uh, reaching out to and communicating with people who reflect and amplify your message that then allows you to bring to you the resources, uh, both financial and physical resources you need to expand your base of operation. That's how this process works. Everything that everybody's ever done that has added value to their lives and the lives of people in the community works through that process. It ain't nothing new, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something that people have been doing for tens of thousands of years. But the formula, the recipe, the process has been hidden from us and then erased. And as a consequence, we find ourselves wondering why everybody else is passing us by and we appear to be stuck, not moving. So it's a simple process. The, the way that I interpret it as a result of 45 years that I've invested in doing this work, it is a simple process. And once you understand how simple it is, and commit yourself to engaging in the process, then that allows you to do the things that you've always had the capacity to do. Thank you, that was, that was powerful and much needed. We're gonna jump into some food. There's a lot that I wanna talk about, <laughs> All right. but I don't want the food to get uh, cold. So okay. we'll dive in and then we'll get back into the conversation. Cool. Oh, I should've gotten some cayenne for the greens. So how long have you been doing this? So I've been doing the show now for two years. What was, you, what was your motivation? Working in an emergency room for six years. And really? Yeah, and I was an ER tech. Mm. Uh, and then I worked on an ambulance for two years. Mm. So seeing the long-term effects of how we eat. Mm -hmm. And when I originally came up with the concept for the show, I would talk to my best friend about it. And long story short, he died mm. two years ago. Okay. And so before he got to see it, so it's kind of something that I continue to do like in remembrance of him. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very important that we are aware of what we put in our body mm -hmm. and how it affects our body. So, you know, I'm really just putting out content that helps our people, that gives us the knowledge and like whether you choose to act on it or not, mm -hmm. it's there. So that's sure. really the motivation behind All it. All right, well, good. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased when I come here or, or spaces like this to see the selection of black folk who come here as well, right? Uh, which lets me know that there's a growing number of our folk who are looking, who are interested in, in eating healthy. So Tony, you're um, vegetarian or vegan? Vegetarian. And you've been, you've been vegetarian for- 48 number. years. You talk about the importance of the vegetarian diet or vegan diet and melanated people. Well, <clears throat> I'm from Chicago, mm -hmm. right? I've been living in D.C. for, gosh, uh, 52 years. I came here in 1971 to attend Howard University. Spent my first winter in D.C. where the temperature never got below freezing and snowed only once and the snow was gone the next day and realized I ain't never going back to Chicago. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and um, so being here in D.C. exposed me to a different mindset of black folk. Uh, an international community of, of, of black folk and opened my eyes to a whole host of things and expanded my you know, understanding of who we are, where we come from, and what we had the capacity to do. And uh, after I graduated from Howard, uh, I started hanging out with, um, with more vegetarians. So this was back in 1974. Um, I don't think that the term veganism existed at that time, either you were a meat eater or a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And I was hanging out with more vegetarians and began to read more about the uh, association between diet and health. And as a matter of fact, one of my primary inspirations was uh, Dick Gregory. You know, Dick Gregory lived in Chicago for quite some time, and he was introduced to uh, health by a sister on the west side, on, on the south side, named Avenia Fulton, Dr. Fulton. And she was, she was Dick Gregory's uh, trainer and, and, and taught him about um, eating healthy. And Dick Gregory wrote a book called um, Cooking with Another Mother Nature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of my favorite books. And he just laid out the philosophy uh, behind uh, becoming a vegetarian. 
and and I read that book. It resonated with me. And then there was another book that I had uh, been introduced to at that time called Back to Eaton by Jeff Wilkos, which is like a, a, was a vegetarian bible at that time. And I remember reading that book, <coughs> him talking about the dangers of of cooking meat above a certain temperature, that, that thing 115, 120 uh, degrees, and what the heat does is turn the cells into the meat uh, and makes them carcinogenic. And so I read that and you know, it fascinated me. And then maybe a week or two later, I'm listening to uh, the six o'clock news and I hear Walter Cronkite talk about a new study that just came out where scientists have discovered that cooking meat at a certain temperature turns the meat cells carcinogenic. I said, well, wait a minute, Jeff O'Call said the same thing 30, 40 years ago. So there must be some value to this information. So I found that <clears throat> once I stopped eating meat and chicken that um, I didn't get colds. You know, living in, uh, in Chicago, I normally caught a, caught a cold two, three times a year. But once I stopped eating certain foods, uh, I stopped creating the environment within my body where the cold virus could live and populate. And so I saw a direct correlation with that. And then as I continued with my, with my development, <clears throat> I decided um, working for two and a half years for somebody else, my first full-time job after college, I realized that as long as I worked for somebody else, they weren't going to value me, they weren't going to pay me what I was worth, and I began making plans to free myself and create my own business. And as a consequence of creating my own business meant that I had to be responsible for generating my income, and the best way I could generate my income is by ensuring that I was in good physical health. So maintaining a proper diet, I had already learned the relationship between uh, diet and health. And I, I, I just put it to the test. All the pieces just clicked together. And um, so it was on October the 12th, um, 1977, was when I stopped eating meat and chicken. Wow. And I've been on that path ever, ever since. And of course, my family in Chicago thought I'd lost my mind, you know. Yeah. Uh, I grew up eating, you know, spare ribs and, and, and chicken and, and turkey and all that stuff, you know. That was what I knew. And once I knew better, I started doing better. And the biggest challenge for me was uh, being in a company of people who didn't understand and who were, you know, mocking me um, for, for changing my lifestyle. I would go home for Thanksgiving and my aunt, who's like my sister, would hold a, a piece of chicken in front of my nose and wave it in front of my <laughs> face. But the other benefit I, I got from that was it taught me self-discipline, right? Uh, to be in the presence of meat eaters and, and, and know that I'm not going to eat the meat because I know what it does to me. And then over years, when I began to see uh, the long-term benefits of maintaining a healthy lifestyle, uh, my weight has is pretty much been the same as it was uh, 50 years ago when I graduated from, from college. Uh, I don't have uh, the illnesses, the diseases that many of my colleagues and family members and, and friends have. Uh, I've lost uh, a lot of friends to, to diabetes and heart attack and, and stroke and things of that nature. Fortunately, I don't have those things, and I can directly associate uh, the quality of my health with the quality of the foods that I put within my body. So as I've been you know, evolving along that path, my thinking has also evolved from the standpoint of, I know that uh, if you are what you eat, <coughs> eating foods that are healthy will make you healthy. Uh, there's also a direct association between food and consciousness, right? Mm. If, if people are what they eat, if you just sit back and watch people's behavior, watch how they act to each other, watch how they talk, watch how they move. You can pretty much tell that person's eating meat, <laughs> that person's eating pork. Uh, you can look at them and, and tell uh, what they're putting in, in, in their body and how it affects them physically. So uh, being able to get these confirmations uh, assured me that I was moving in the right direction. But also along the same line, I realized that uh, along with the discipline that it takes to live in a uh, meat-eating environment and not eat meat, uh, strengthens your resolve, right? And as a result of strengthening your re resolve, it helps to raise your consciousness, right? And I went through that phase where, where I thought uh, that I was, you know, because I was vegetarian, I was better than the meat eaters, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's a process that I had to grow into and grow through uh, because <clears throat> as I've gotten older, what I've come to realize is that many of my friends who are vegetarians, uh, you know, Dick Gregory and a number of folk who work with him, Brother Bay and, and others that I grew to, to know and love and appreciate, they started getting ill, right? 
And part of them getting ill wasn't due to the fact that they were vegetarians. It was a confirmation of the reality that the environment is so screwed up. Everything is polluted. The air is polluted. The soil is polluted. The water is polluted. So just because you're vegetarian doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're going to live a longer life than somebody who eats meat. So I began reevaluating that whole process and, and realized that, yeah, we have to take responsibility for what we put into our bodies, but we also have to be aware of the environment in which we live and factor all of these things together to determine how we're going to move. Another point I'll make is the fact that uh, many of my friends who are vegetarians or vegan, again, still have this holier-than-thou attitude, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I know is flawed, right? Because I know a lot of meat eaters who do good work, right? Uh, and, and that's because they're following a different life path. So the, there is a direct association between food and consciousness, but it's not the only uh, denominator. The other reality is, if you think in terms of what would a society look like if the leader of that society was a vegetarian or a vegan. Uh, if the leader of that society uh, reinforced standards that would encourage people to eat well and then hired people to work for them uh, who were also vegetarians, who also adopted a similar um, mindset, what would that society look like? Uh, and then found out, studying history, that such a society existed. Mm. That society existed uh, in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. That society was led by Adolf Hitler, who was a vegetarian. Mm. So just because you're vegetarian and eating well doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to think well and act well. So what I've come to understand and appreciate is that cultivating a different relationship with food, um, uh, as uh, Elijah Muhammad said, knowing how to eat to live, but also knowing how to live uh, a righteous and meaningful life makes a difference. So making a decision about the quality of your food elevates your consciousness to a certain um, a certain position, but then once you're at that position, you now can see things differently that you couldn't see before because your mind is clearer, your body is clearer. But then as you elevate to another position of consciousness, you realize that there are other factors at play that you have to take into consideration in order to fulfill your reason for being here. So I see um, a person making choices in the foods that they, that they eat is one step in the process of, of human, mental, and physical and spiritual development, but it's not the only one. All of these factors have to be taken into consideration in order for us to do the things that we really and ultimately have the capacity to do. So, Tony, you mentioned um, that you're able to like look at people and kind of see what kind of diets they have. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned in your book I want to ask you about, um, how do our thoughts about others affect our lives and the frequency of what we manifest and our ability to manifest? Well, one of the things that we have to realize is that everything is energy. <clears throat> everything is energy. And that energy functions at different levels, different rates, right? As you slow energy down, it becomes denser and it materializes, it solidifies. So if you look at energy um, from the standpoint of, um, say, let's, let's say chakras, for example, right? seven basic, basic chakras. Uh, the first chakra is the root chakra, which represents the, the earth, the foundation, the base, uh, lower frequency vibrations. And the goal is to move higher and higher to the crown chakra, which connects you with, the, with spirit, with the ancestors. And uh, each chakra is a different vibration, a different energy. So the goal is to do as earth, wind, and fire encourage us to do with one of their biggest hits, that's the way of the world, right? Hearts of fire create love desire to take you higher, higher to your place on the throne. It was about moving your energy from the lower level to at least the heart level, which is the fourth chakra. And once you get it to that level, then it's easier to, to escalate your thoughts, your energy, your vibrations to the crown chakra, your place on the throne. So what, what I discovered in my journey to enlightenment is that there were people who had walked this path before me who left breadcrumbs, right? Uh, either in their music or their writings or other things. And that was intended to open the eyes of those who are ready to follow in that, in that, uh, in that direction, right? So music is one of the vehicles <clears throat> through which you can transfer consciousness. Everybody listens to music, everybody loves music. So music like food can either elevate your consciousness or diminish your consciousness. So if you look at a lot of uh, the music 
that uh, young folk are listening to now is music that's geared toward the, the lower frequency vibration, toward the root chakra. It's music that focuses on materialism, uh, denigrating people. Uh, and that's the music that this society promotes because what it leads to is a diminishment of the consciousness of black people. You contrast that to the music of my generation of, of the 60s, Motown, Curtis Mayfield, um, uh, the Shy Lights. It was a music uh, that was about transforming the consciousness of people, right? And you saw <clears throat> during the 60s, which I, I contend was the most significant decade within the past two centuries, black folk developed a sense of power and consciousness that was fueled by the music, right? And because, of, uh, because the music carried a message that helped to, to uh, expand our consciousness, those who benefit from keeping us functioning on a subservient level and being comfortable with that had to undo that, that progress. And so they introduced a different form of music that changed the vibration and, and, and made us comfortable doing our own thing, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and focusing our time and energy on things that debased us as opposed to things that lifted us higher and higher. So everything is about vibration, man. And there is vibration in the food. There's vibration in, if you think in terms of um, uh, the animals that people consume, uh, there have been a host of movies about uh, the research that was done looking at animals uh, in slaughterhouses, uh, the chickens and the cows in the slaughterhouses, uh, being in that environment where death, the smell of death is in the air, the vibration of death is in the air. So these animals are internalizing that vibration as they're being killed. So what that does is it causes the secretion of adrenaline throughout their bodies, which saturates every cell in their body. So they die in that matter, and then you eat that meat, which means that you internalize that energy, you internalize that vibration. So. The, the, the phrase, you are what you eat, is applicable. So once people begin to understand how specifically since, I would say specifically since, since the 70s, um, we're no longer eating food. We're eating ultra-processed commodities that's passed on to us as food, right? Uh, with the introduction of high fructose corn syrup, right? Which is in everything, um, sugar, is the chemical structure of sugar is one molecule away from crack. Sugar is as addictive as, ho uh, as cocaine, as heroin, as nicotine. And sugar manufacturers know that. So you find those products in everything because we live in a, we live in a sick care society, not a health care society, where uh, the food manufacturers and medical schools and the pharmaceutical companies are, are working in concert to keep you just live enough such that you don't die. And they can continue to make money off of you, feeding you food that will make you sick, giving you medications that will keep you healthy enough to keep from dying mm. so that you're a continual customer. So here in this country specifically, it's all about the money. Uh, folk don't give a damn about people. It's all about the money. And that lays, uh, follows the path of the creation of this country. Uh, United States is not a democracy, uh, never was. United States is a slaveocracy built on the foundation of death and destruction, right? Uh, and so that pattern has not changed. So the only thing that can change if you live in this society is the consciousness of the people moving through this society. Understand where you are. Understand how things function around you. And once you understand that, then through the application of that understanding, you can move in this death-centered environment and not die, not die physically, mentally, or spiritually, because you can now tap into a different energy, a different consciousness that will feed you, feed your body, feed your mind, feed your soul. And that's what this whole thing is all about. The other reality is, <clears throat> is that not everybody will get it. Right. That's it. Not everybody will get it. Not everybody has capacity to get it, because your capacity to understand, to, to, to resonate with certain uh, energy vibrations, thought transforming energy vibrations is dependent on your base energy here in your body. And if you're eating foods that won't allow you to change your frequency, then you're going to stay stuck and be comfortable being stuck. And what I've learned over time, you know, making this journey is that um, as, as I grow 
uh, the natural, as anybody grows and develops, your natural tendency is, want, is to want to reach out and save those folk around you, family members, loved ones, friends. But the reality is everybody is exactly where they want to be, mm. whether they know it or not. Right? Wow. Um, and so it's a matter of <clears throat> respecting others' choice to be meat eaters. And the only thing that we could do is model for them the benefits of not eating meat or the benefits of not behaving certain ways so that when that person is ready to look for a new path in life, they can look to you as an example, come to you, ask you questions, and then follow your example and change their lives. That's the process, right? So it's all about, it's all about for me, in, in, in my understanding now, it's all about understanding the environment in which we live, knowing how to negotiate that environment maximize your outcome so that you can leave something of value for the people who come behind you. Wow. Bars. As we're talking about music, you just dropped some bars okay. on us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's stay on music for a minute. So, you know, you mentioned the 60s and the higher consciousness in the music. I feel like Kendrick Lamar is somebody that's doing that in this current mm -hmm. era. I'm not sure if you're really familiar with his music. Mm -hmm. but. Um, Another question about music, you talked about in Nile Valley uh, Contributions how a lot of our ancestors have been purported to be Europeans, right? So I'm just asking, was Beethoven black? Well, let, let's put it this way. <coughs> let's put it this way. Uh, Beethoven had African ancestors. Mm -hmm. Now, whether he saw himself as black is another issue, right? But Beethoven had uh, black ancestors, and I forget you know, his, his direct genealogy, but there are many people classified as Europeans who uh, have African ancestry, and were they living in America during the time frame when the one drop rule was in effect, he would have been labeled as a black person. One drop of black blood makes you black. That was Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. in his book, Notes for the States of Virginia. One drop of black blood makes anybody black. So. Uh, to some people, that's a badge of dishonor, but to someone with their memories restored, one drop of black blood speaks to the power of blackness. If one drop <laughs> wow. makes anybody black, then there's power in blackness. So once you know that, once you appreciate that power, then you speak openly and proudly about the black blood that you have. Uh, Beethoven living in Germany, working in Germany, uh, and we all know the mindset of Germans, the Aryan people, the superior people, that, that whole nonsense. In order for him to thrive as a musician working for white folk, he had to move among them as one of them. Uh -huh. So the environment that we're in determines how we see ourselves. Uh, you know, and even in, in this country, we've got black folk who pass for white. Why? Because there were benefits of moving in a racist society passing as a white person than living and struggling as a black person. I get it. I understand it. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, but I understand why some folk do. And the other part of that is I've come to understand and appreciate that there are some black folk who pass for white in order to get access to information that was only available to white folk and then share that information with folk in their community. And there are some white folk who had access to knowledge and information and power who chose to share that information with black folk. So when you, when you really extrapolate what all of this means, man, and process what all of this means, I talked about this in the last chapter of Browder Five Two Survival Strategies for Africans in America. Color, culture, and consciousness. When you live in a racist environment, everything is predicated upon the color of your skin. The darker your skin, the less rights and privileges you have. So color runs our lives. And as we began in the 60s, as we began to, to accept blackness as a badge of honor and not something to be shameful of, we began to talk about, I'm black and I'm proud. We began talking about black is beautiful. So we embraced a culture which affirmed uh, the melanin in our skin. We saw black is beautiful. And that shifted our consciousness, right? But, but then, as I grew older and, 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 and and, and process what I was learning, I realized that the main issue that we're confronted with is not color, it's not culture, it's consciousness. I know some black folk uh, who are as harmful to black folk as white folk are. I know some white folk 
who are as beneficial to, to black folk as some of our greatest heroes and sheroes have been. And so it's about consciousness. Consciousness transcends color. And so when, when you're talking about things on that level, what you're dealing with is the essence of your soul, right? Uh, and that if we accept the, the, the standard concept that every body consists of a body, a mind, and a soul, and really understand African history, culture, and consciousness, African people have always talked about the immortality of the soul, right? The body is temporary. The body is a vehicle for the soul. And in that concept, the body is temporary, the body dies, and the souls are recycled into new bodies. So as a consequence of, of that consciousness, that reality, then um, we do come back. Life is eternal. We are born again. An old soul is born into a new body. And if that old soul is capable of remembering the path that it was on in the previous lifetime or the previous lifetimes, and then be able to access that information, uh, that knowledge, that power in the current lifetime, then that soul is what's regarded in society as a genius. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a musical genius, whether it's an, an athlete, whether it's a scientist, uh, like, like George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver is, is probably one of the best examples that I can give you because he acknowledged the transcendent nature of the soul. He acknowledged that um, um, as, a, as a scientist, he would do his best work early in the morning before sunrise. He would walk in the forest to commune with his creator and talked about the creator transmitting knowledge like a, a, a radio transmits sound frequencies and he was able to tap into that consciousness, tap into those frequencies. And then after his morning walk, he would then come to his laboratory and he would sit down and do his work. And he, and he described, um, in, in one of his books, he described coming back in uh, from his walk, sitting down at his desk, sitting before a sweet potato plant and having a conversation with that plant, a soul-to-soul -soul conversation with that plant, and saying, you know, you're such a marvelous um, uh, product. You know, our creator has created something special in you. Tell me your secrets. Tell me how, how you came into being. And Carver said the plant communicated with him, and he made notes. And as a result of that communication, as a result of those notes, he was able to create over 200 different products from the sweet potato plant, right? Mm -hmm. From the... From the um, um, the peanut, right? And so that's the level of consciousness that we as human beings possess. But it's not in this society's interest uh, via the educational process or the food production process to teach us how to cultivate that aspect of our beingness. So my work as a memory recovery specialist is all about doing the research, finding those examples of human beings who knew who they were and left examples for us to follow, and then offering that advice, that information to folk who are looking to transform their lives. And everything boils down to a matter of choice. What do you want to do? If you want to do better, you access that information, uh, the, 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 the vibrations, the consciousness of people who have done better. And you replicate that. You draw that energy into you, and you find yourself doing better. That's how the process works. And this process works independent of uh, religious systems, right? Uh, independent of uh, these concepts of God. God is a concept, right? And different religions, different societies, different cultures have their own God concepts. So one of the things that, that I've learned to understand is who is God's concept are you embracing? Mm. Is it the God concept of your former enslaver? Mm. Uh, the God concept of, of those who stole you and, and raped you and beat you and lynched you? Or is it the God concept of your ancestors? Mm. Who ancestors who affirm that you were one with the creator. You were not God, uh, you were not the creator, but you, you contain act, act, aspects of the creator within you. 
And when you align yourself with that reality, when you align yourself with that reality, that vibration, that, that energy, that frequency, that consciousness, then you become a creator. So we are here to create. We are creators, but we are not the creator. You mentioned Kendrick Lamar. Uh, he's come on the scene. He's become this phenomenal artist. Uh, and he is bringing a different consciousness to, to, to folk who internalize his sound vibration, his music. So I listened to him, I'm impressed with what he did. I was impressed with uh, the song that he incorporated into uh, the film Black Panther, mm -hmm. which uh, I think is one of the most significant movies ever made. The one thing that bothers me, that deserves me, understanding the power of sound vibration and its ability to transform consciousness is whenever you're using that vessel, and cursing using profanity, you're undermining the power in that message. It's like putting poison in your vegetarian meal, mm. right? So understand what a curse is. A curse is an evil spell that one casts on another person using sound vibration, right? right. So when you are using profanity in your music, then you're undercutting the value of that music. But if you don't know that, if you live in an environment where profanity is the order of the day, it's natural, right? Then whatever positive you choose to do in your life is undermined by the negativity that comes from the words that you speak. So it's like moonwalking. <laughs> you're moving forward backwards. Hmm. What kind of progress are you making? So. You know, as we move forward, we have to elevate our consciousness so that we see everything that we're doing and the impact of everything that we're doing, not just for ourselves, but on the people around us. Because, you know, this, this concept uh, of karma is real. What you do comes back to you, comes back tenfold, whether you're conscious of it or not. So to be able to move through the world with uh, an awareness of the power of karma, which I, uh, you know, most people think of karma as cause and effect. Uh, what I've now come to understand that karma is really an Eastern interpretation of the African concept of Maat, right? Uh, Maat is a u ubiquitous force that permeates the, the cosmos and it seeks to balance itself. And, and Maat, in essence, means balance and harmony and reciprocity and things of that nature. So whatever you give out, uh, you, you basically become a, a, a beacon that draws that same energy to you and then you amplify it based on what you do. So with that understanding, with that knowledge, we create our own reality. We have the capacity to create either heaven or hell here on earth based on what we think, what we say, and what we do. So in a, in a perfect world where we were grounded in the culture that taught us that information from the cradle to the grave, you would have a different level of consciousness and a different society, which is one of the reasons why you know, people such as my spell, myself spend so much time focusing on Nile Valley civilization, specifically Kemet. Because in the Nile Valley, specifically in Kemet and Kush, we can find the best examples of human endeavors when their mind, bodies, and souls were aligned. Nobody on this planet has been able to replicate what Africans in the Nile Valley uh, did 5,000, 6,000 years ago when we were in control of our destiny. We were the model, we were the standard for what it meant to be human. So that's why everybody wanted to come into the Nile Valley in order to learn how to be human and then take that knowledge back to Greece, to Rome, to other parts of the world to humanize the people there, but because folk who came in, the invaders, were suffering from a diminished concept of, of spirit, right? A diminished quality of, of, of soul, if you will. They could take something that was beautiful and get it bass backwards. Mm. And instead of using those things to build and amplify uh, the benefits of human nature, they used it to control and to manipulate people within their environment. So these are the forces that we're fighting against now. And it's a fight that has been going on for at least 2,000 years. Uh, and we're reaching a tipping point right now where we're seeing dramatic shifts in politics, the economy, and the environment. And something has got to give, right? 
uh, because as people have been hell-bent on destroying the environment and destroying each other, that energy is being amplified. It's speeding up and it's coming back now. So uh, you, you do reap what you sow. Uh, so as uh, the, the debt comes due on all the evil the people have done in the world, what I am advocating to those who are willing to listen is that you don't have to go down with the Titanic. We got options. To know that you have options and to be willing to engage in options that you know will benefit you and your families you can carve out a special space for yourself in this world such that you don't have to go down with the ship. And if we look at history from that perspective, what we find is that history, documented history, uh, provides us with examples of people who went through the exact same thing that we're going through now. There's nothing new in the world except the history you don't know, right? Mm. And so you look at the stories of people who survived difficult times. Those are the examples that you follow those are the examples that you replicate in life today, which, which ensures a greater chance of your ability to not only survive, but to thrive. And that history is written by people who survive. And they then have an opportunity to create a new world based on what they know. So in the midst of all the, the craziness that's going on all around us, uh, I could take comfort in knowing that, that this is not the only thing, and that a better day is coming, a brighter day is coming, uh, if we're engaged in the process of making sure that that happens. So these are options that are available to us. And, and to be honest with you, have always been available to us. Many of us just couldn't see it because we were blinded by, by shiny, fancy things, or sexy things, mm -hmm. uh, or tasty food, right, that made us feel good. Uh, but gave us uh, short-term benefits. So what are you saying those options are for the people who don't want to go down with the Titanic? Um, to read, mm -hmm. to study, and to apply what you've read and studied in your life. To use those things that you know are beneficial and cast aside those things that don't work. So as you accumulate more knowledge about things that are beneficial to you, you then move faster through time and space. Uh, you no longer encounter the roadblocks that others encounter. And, and you, you know when you're doing it right. right? You can see it. You know, uh, one other thing to consider is if it's true that we make our own heaven and hell on earth, um, poverty and illness are states of mind, states of being that we can control. Uh, it's been said that 70% of the illnesses that we have, diabetes and certain forms of cancer and hypertension, it's related to diet. It's related to thought. Change your, your, your diet, change your thoughts, and you change your relationship with your physical body. You change your relationship with your consciousness, and you uh, begin to master the ability to move through life with greater and greater success. And that's what this whole thing is all about. Mm. It's a lot in there. It's a lot to digest. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned the ancestors a lot and communing mm -hmm. with the ancestors. How do we do that? How do we get in touch with them? What does that process look like? Is it the same as like praying to God? And or what is your, your thoughts on sure. that? Sure. So uh, if you think in terms of prayer or meditation or mindfulness, these are all similar practices, right? Similar processes where you focus your attention on specific things that you want to bring into manifestation. It's using your power as a creator to determine what you want to create. Now, we live in a society where we've been taught, and let me just go ahead and say it and put it out there because it needs to be said. We live in a society where we've been taught that we've been born in sin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I disagree with that 125%. Uh, you're born in sin, uh, and, a, and as a consequence of being born in sin, the Son of God had to die for your sins. And by following the path of this Son of God, you can be born in heaven. Now, just put that thought aside for a minute. Let's just say that you were born to create, right? And you have the capacity within you to create those things that will benefit you, benefit your family, and benefit your community. And everything within your social environment reinforced that fact. So there is no fear 
of, of the Creator. There's no fear of God because you know you and the Creator and God are one. There's no fear of, of, of being born in sin. There is no fear of burning in hell. You have a consciousness that says that you are here for a specific purpose. You're here to manifest the powers, creative powers and abilities within you. And your socialization process helps you to cultivate those abilities so that you build for eternity. Those are the examples that we have in the Nile Valley. So when we understand that, that the essence of who we are is based on who we were. We are our ancestors. We carry the DNA of everybody along our family line going back hundreds, thousands of years. So when you know, like for me, let, let me personalize this for a minute. Um, my grandmother is, is one of my ancestors that I knew, that raised me, that loved me, that I, I revere, right? Uh, and so she is someone that I call upon whenever I'm in need of information, guidance, or protection. Why do I say that? I say that because I saw her do that when she was praying at night, right? And, and I heard her uh, say in conversations as a child, that um, you know, she decided to do X, Y, and Z, and A, B, and C because a little birdie told me. You know, I had a dream last night, and a little birdie told me. I didn't have the cultural context in order to decipher what she was saying, but it was uh, decades later when I began to understand the significance of Nile Valley civilization that the little birdie was the Ba, right? And the Ba in, in Nile Valley culture is the soul, right? Is the ancestor who comes to you sometimes in a dream, sometimes in a thought, and answers your questions or answers your prayers and tells you what it is that you could or should be doing. So if you are in tune to that ancestral voice, then you'll find a path forward as opposed to being stuck on stupid. So the ancestors are the essence of life. And through my studies of the Nile Valley, specifically through the past 15 years that I've spent you know, excavating tombs uh, on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt, going in and out of tombs, rebuilding tombs that are 2,700 years old, reconstructing uh, the walls and the writings on the walls and the images on the wall, that what became apparent to me is these people understood the value of ancestral acknowledgement. And part of ancestral acknowledgement consists of pouring libation, inviting ancestors to come into your space, providing them with, with food, feeding them, and creating a sacred space where you can be one with them, ask them questions, ask them for healing, guidance, and protection. So we've got records, we've got documents of this process going on for over 3,000 years, right? So this is, this is not a, a, a wild concept, this is a reality. And when you begin to understand the power uh, of genetics, that we carry our ancestors in our bodies, in our DNA, we un when you understand that there is such a thing as genetic memory, right? Memories of our ancestors that we carry in our, in our DNA that we have the capacity to access. And when you download the, that ancestral knowledge, then it provides you with the tools you need in order to thrive in any society in any society anywhere in the world. So I've come to understand that ancestral acknowledgement is the only AI that matters to a conscious mm. person, you know? Uh, you know, we live in a society that, that, that delights in injecting us with fear. You know, uh, 23 years ago it was fear of Y2K. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago it was a fear of the COVID vaccine. Fear, 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 uh, we're told um, uh, we hear often in, in Christianity you're putting the fear of God in somebody. As Dick Gregory often said, fear and God can't occupy the same space. Fear is the absence of God. So when you have the courage to look beyond fear, right, and see the reality that is also available to you, then you have access to the knowledge, to the power that will allow you to live the life that you are supposed to be living as a human being, as a spirit in physical form. So the ancestors are the vehicles that transfer that knowledge to us. So 
Africans have created those things that have benefited them for thousands of years because they were connected to their ancestors. Through the process of enslavement, uh, we had to be separated from the knowledge. We had to be taught that to, to acknowledge your ancestors is pagan, is voodoo, is calling on evil spirits, to pour libation, is, is something that is evil, is devil worship, is things of that nature. So our oppressor has done everything within their power to separate us from our power. Why? Because they knew that once we begin to access to that which is within us, they will not be able to control us. Hmm. And we live in a society where control is everything. As Carter G. Woodson said, if you control a person's thinking, their thoughts, you don't have to worry about their actions. You don't have to worry about what they speak, say, and do. So it's about knowing yourself, tapping into that wellspring of knowledge, that ancestral wellspring of intelligence that we are born with bringing that information forward, bringing those voices forward, and allowing the ancestors to speak to us and through us so that we will be the vessels through which our ancestors do our best work. That's the process. It's simple, it's easy, and it's the only way people of African ancestry in this society has thrived as a people. Um, this may turn off some of, your, some of your, your viewers, some of your listeners, but I'll say it anyway because it needs to be heard. It ain't Jesus. You know, our enslavers gave us Jesus because they knew that that would keep us running in circles, chasing our tails. Our folk don't read, uh, and as a consequence, we don't know when Jesus, the concept of Jesus, was created. We don't understand that there was no letter J prior to uh, the 16th century. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is not his name. So that's a, that's a good segue. So from 2001 to about 2013, that's mm -hmm. the chapter of my life I call the church years. So okay. apostolic, Pentecostal, mm -hmm. Bible college, all mm -hmm. of the above, gospel albums, like that was my life. Okay. And in 2011, I had a chance to visit Egypt and I remember distinctly looking at the hieroglyphs and my uh, tour guide at the time, Saeed, said, yeah, this is where the concept of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost came from. And so that was like the first like question mark in my head. Mm -hmm. And then like in reading your, your book, you made mention of, I believe it's Asur, Aset, and Haru. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of talk about that and the relation to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph? Sure. Well, as I said earlier, there's nothing new in the world except the history you don't know. One of the reasons why, you know, I've been traveling to, to Egypt or, or Kemet, uh, so so often is because that's where the oldest documents of human endeavors can be found. And that once you understand what's there, then you'll see that, that Kemet has served as the springboard for which other civilizations in all religions, or specifically the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, evolved out of African spiritual systems. So Asara, Set, and Heru, the story of Asara, and Set, and Heru, who we know better by their European names, um, uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, um, is the prototype for the family unit, is the prototype of the Trinity, is the prototype for masculine and feminine energy, and how that energy works together in order to produce an offspring. That is the prototype of, of the, the Trinity. So just a, a, a short interpretation of these concepts. Um, Asar was uh, the person who united the two lands of Kemet and established the first nation state. Uh, he introduced writing, he introduced agriculture, he introduced the means by which he could feed the people physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, and then once he established his nation, he married a sister by the name of Aset, who was his co-equal. She was not subservient to him. Uh, and then he decided to travel to other parts of the continent to share his technology with others to lift them up out of darkness. And in his absence, he left his wife, uh, his helpmate, to, to run their nation. Uh, this act angered Asar's brother, who killed Asar, dismembered his body, and then took over rulership of the land. A set, and this is, you know, this is a, an old story, and I'm condensing it incredibly, but a set then, when searching for her husband's body, not only was he killed, but his body was dismembered and cut into a variety of parts. Uh, she literally 
found the parts of Asar's body, washed them, anointed them with oils, and literally remembered her husband, uh, created the first so-called mummy in, in world history. And then as the set was about to bury her husband, uh, she grieved as any wife would grieve because she was about to bury the man that she loved. She grieved because according to the story, uh, Asar and Aset had never consummated their marriage, so Aset was still a virgin. So before the virgin Aset buried her husband, uh, she prayed to the Creator. And the spirit of Asar came and impregnated his virgin wife Aset. And then nine months later, the virgin Aset gave birth to their son Heru. So, uh, if we just look at, at these simple, this simple story, which is a myth, right? Uh, it's a myth that, it's a story that is not true, but it contains truth. And it's a means by which scientific, philosophical, and historical information can be passed down to future generations. So this virgin of Set gave birth to her son, Heru, uh, who was born on the same birth date as his father. That birth date uh, translates into December the 25th, right? Uh, so Heru was born of a virgin on, his, on December the 25th, and his job was to avenge the murder of his father and reclaim his father's kingdom. If you travel to, to Egypt uh, and visit temples, you will find this information documented on the walls of the temple. So this entire story is replicated throughout the temples and the papyri and, and, and statuary, uh, statues that were created throughout this 5,000 year old civilization. And it tells a story of, of, of an African trinity. It tells a story of, of knowing yourself and the potential that exists within every person. When Kemet fell, invaders came in and took pieces of this body of knowledge and used this to create governments and religious systems. So if you have a baseline understanding of the history and philosophy and spiritual traditions of Kemet, you can see the origins of Judaism. Uh, there is no, as, 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 as a historian, as a researcher, as someone who spent time uh, uh, with, with archaeology, there is no physical evidence to substantiate anything in the Torah or the Bible. There's, Jews were never enslaved in Egypt. There was no Moses. These are stories. These are myths. The story of the birth of Jesus Christ, that is a story that is a myth that was created at a specific point in time in history in order to use religion as a means of controlling the minds of the masses. That's what it is. That's what it has been. Uh, some people can accept this uh, and other people can't. And that's their choice. I'm not saying this to dissuade anybody. I'm sharing this information to restore the memories of those who are ready to have their memories restored. I get it, this ain't for everybody. But for those who were a part of the church and who always had questions, questions that could not be answered by the church, we were just told to, you know, just, just be, be quiet, just accept that everything is gonna be all right. And as a child, I grew up in the church. My grandmother was the closest thing to God that, that I, as a young child, uh, knew. She prayed every day. She went to church every day, took me to church with her. And I started asking questions. Why is there nobody in the Bible who looks like me? God is white. Jesus is white. All the angels are white. Oh, color doesn't matter. Just be quiet. Just be quiet. But color does matter. If it didn't matter, then based on the so-called historical uh, knowledge, based on where Jesus lived, he lived among people who were brown skinned, had brown eyes, and hair like lamb's wool. So this image of Jesus that we have in our churches was an image that was created by Leonardo da Vinci, a blonde haired blue eyed uh, European. So these images are not true, but there's truth incorporated within some of the imagery and some of the text, but one has to be able to have the knowledge to know how to discern the truth from the falsehood. And, and, and that's a, a short version, <laughs> a yeah. short response to your question. So people can learn more about that in your writings. Right. And I think it's extremely important because the truth is going to be the truth. Well, to that point, brother, being a vegan or a vegetarian is going to turn off a lot of people. Right. So no matter what you do, you're going to turn some people on, you're going to turn some people off. The main thing is to be intentional about what you do and to cause no harm. Uh, and the other thing about truth, the truth is relative. Mm -hmm. There's a line in the Bible, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put away childish thinking. I began to study. I began to read. I began to understand that the Bible contains truth, but the Bible is not true. I was told that by a minister who taught me how to read between the lines and understand the metaphors, uh, the, the science that is encoded in the Bible. The Bible is not a book to be taken literally. And contrary to what most black people have been taught, 
Uh, the Bible is not the inerrant word of God. The Bible is comprised of 66 different books written by 66 different people over a period of 2,000 years. That's the truth. Some people can accept that, some people can't, and the bottom line is, it's your choice. I'm not proselytizing, I'm not trying to impose my thoughts or beliefs on anybody. I'm encouraging people to, to read, to study, to ask questions. And anytime you're in an environment, anytime you're in a space where someone doesn't want you to ask questions, you, that's, a, that's a red flag, and you should leave that environment. We should always be encouraged to ask questions. And we should also be, be, we should also listen to people who are capable of providing resources for what they say. If someone can't back up what they say with at least four different resources, you should back away from that, peop that person. Mm. Wow, I agree. Good. <laughs> I, I want to read something from, uh, and it's from the Brotophile, Volume 2. Okay, Survival Strategies yes. for Africans in America, 13 Steps to Freedom. Got you it. said, they have sustained their position of power and authority over Africans in America by destroying the Africans' ability to visualize while encouraging them to dream. There is a fundamental difference between a vision and a dream. Dreams are abstract illusions that occur when one is in, in an unconscious state of mind. Dreams dry up like a raisin in the sun and lead to frustration, anger, and despair. Visions occur during a state of heightened, heightened awareness and provide insight into areas where the mind is trained and focused. Visions are, visions are capable of connecting a mind to a higher source of consciousness and empowerment. This is a spiritual law which leads to the fulfillment of thoughts and ideas and th therefore happiness. So, Damn, I wrote that? You wrote that. Ooh, okay. So, <laughs> final question, uh, can you expound upon like we've all been sold to dream and taught to dream, mm -hmm. but the difference between that and to visualize and how do we get back to the visualization? Sure, dreams only work when you sleep. You have to be unconscious to dream. Uh, visions manifest themselves while you are awake. And visions are essentially the process of tapping into your ancestral memory and being inspired. Right? inspired, inspirited. So it's the spirit of your ancestors that comes into your consciousness that gives you a notion of what you could and should be doing. That's the basic difference between the two. So everybody dreams and everybody has visions. The key is to know how to amplify and manifest your vision such that they become a reality. So here in this society, we've been taught that one of our greatest leaders was a dreamer, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and they talk about his speech, his 1963 speech, um, which they have reduced to three words. I have a dream, four words, I have a dream, right? But if we understand when King gave that speech, that wasn't the essence of his speech. His speech was about uh, people of African ancestry cultivating a more meaningful uh, relationship with the United States of America. He talked about America had written a bad check to black folk, and he talked about specific things that we could and should be doing as they marched on Washington, D.C. to demand jobs and justice. We still don't have the jobs, and we still don't have justice, but they have given us the dream. And if you, if you read what has been written about that historic event, that dynamic speech. Uh, King was finishing up his speech and Mahalia Jackson was standing in the wings. And she said, Martin, tell them about the dream. Tell them about the dream. Now, uh, Martin and, and Mahalia Jackson had been traveling all throughout the South um, uh, doing, uh, you know, rallying the, 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 the masses to march for freedom, justice, and equality. And Mahalia would sing, use sound vibration in, t in order to open up the consciousness of the congregation. Martin would come in and give people specific instructions for things that they could do. And as part of um, the, his, his, his routine, his act, if you will, he talked about the dream, I have a dream. So, so it was a dream that he wanted to manifest as a vision of reality. So Mahalia Jackson had heard that speech and she knew, this sister knew, that this is what people needed to hear at the moment. So he did that, I have a dream. And that's only like three minutes of a, a 27 minute speech. Mm -hmm. But that's what everyone holds on to and that's what uh, the people in the society have locked uh, focus their attention on to keep you dreamy as opposed to understanding the deeper message in, 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 King's, uh, in King's speech. So as we move forward, 
um, as King matured in his thinking, he began to embrace the black consciousness movement. And there's a, a speech of his uh, that you can find on YouTube where he talks about being black and beautiful. He talked about embracing his blackness. He saw King in the latter years of his life learn the wisdom of Malcolm X in, in, in seeing yourself as a person of African ancestry and accentuating that aspect of yourself, that vision of yourself as a person of African ancestry. So King began to move in that direction uh, in the last year of his life when he gave the speech uh, why I opposed the war in Vietnam that was given uh, a year to the day which he was assassinated, he talked, about, um, he talked about this struggle for power being a global struggle based uh, a battle between Europeans and people of color. He began to connect the dots that Malcolm had connected before he was assassinated. So once King pivoted, he became marked for death. Um, King, during the last year of his life, realized that nonviolence was not a viable strategy. During the last year of King's life, he started carrying a gun for his own protection because he saw his friends and colleagues murdered. And he knew that this thing wasn't going to work. The other reality that we have to look at is, why is it that 95% of all of the leaders of Negroes, color people, um, African Americans have, have come from the ministry, whether it's the Nation Islam or the church. Why is that? Because our oppressor knows that as long as we hitch our wagon to religion, whether it's Christianity or Islam, and I don't mean to step on people's toes, but I'm just telling historical truth, then as long as you're praying to somebody's concept of God, and not cultivating the God consciousness that dwells within you, you will always be subservient to somebody else. It's about empowering yourself with the knowledge. It's about envisioning what you have the capacity to do, acting on those visions, and then transforming your behavior, your speech, and transforming the world. That's what our oppressors fear for. So they'll keep us focusing on dreams. They'll keep us uh, comfortable worshiping gods who never deliver on the prayers that we've been making. If anybody should be free from oppression, it should be us. Mm. You know, if anybody should be free in this society, it should be us. But we find ourselves suffering more today than we did 50 years ago. So we gotta stop and ask ourselves the question, why is it that we have not made the progress that we thought we should have made at this time? So, so in, in, that, in that context, let me just give you an analogy. When you have a plumbing problem, your toilet doesn't work. You call a plumber and the plumber will come and, and fix whatever needs to be fixed and you'll flush the toilet and you'll see the toilet works and you pay that person. You have a problem with, with your car. You take your car to the automotive dealer. They'll analyze the problem. They replace your battery. They replace your transmission. They replace your brakes. You drive out and that thing works. You have a pain in your tooth. You go to a dentist. The dentist takes an x-ray, checks out the problem, uh, fills the cavity or whatever and you walk out that door knowing that you've got what you came to get. We've been praying to other people's gods for centuries and we have not received what we've been praying for. Maybe we're doing the wrong thing. Now, not everybody can accept that reality and that's cool, but for those who are looking for answers, uh, those such as yourself, those such as myself, who are looking for answers, the answers are there. And to seek those answers does not, does not make you a heathen does not mean that you're going to burn in hell. It means that you have, you have discovered the capacity to manifest your ability as a, as a spirit in human form to create heaven on earth and to open the doors of heaven for anyone who's willing to be a part of your world. These are options that are available to us. And those who understand that and can follow those options will reap the benefits. Those who don't, won't. And it's okay. It's your choice. Everything that we do in life, whether we're conscious of it or not, is our choice. Once you know that, once you act on that knowledge, it's a game changer. Mm. Well, where can people find you? Uh, best way to find me is... Um, on, on the internet, uh, you can go to uh, www.ikg-info.com, ikg-info.com. You can find my books. You can find um, uh, 
tapes of my lectures. You find a bunch of stuff uh, uh, on YouTube. Uh, we do study tours to Egypt or, or Kemet. Uh, we have an Egypt on the Potomac field trip in Washington, D.C. that we've been doing for over 34 years now, where I've shown that the essence of uh, ancient Egyptian architecture symbolism uh, spirituality is lit literally encoded in the architectural layout of Washington, D.C., and that was done over 200 years ago as a means of using this power in order to empower the oppressor. You know, the power exists, and it can be used by good or bad. The hammer is a tool that can be used to build a house or hit somebody in the head like Nancy Pelosi's husband <laughs> was hitting in the head. So these tools are available to us. What is the consciousness of the person that is using the tool? That makes all the difference in the world. So I'm an advocate of, of knowing yourself and doing for self. I've been doing this work for well over 45 years, and people can access uh, me on the internet, write, uh, read my books, and uh, choose to be a part of this transformation of consciousness if they choose to. Tony. It's my uh, most important interview to date. I'm honored to be sitting down with you and thank you. And anytime you want to talk about anything, you got an open invite to the show. Okay. Well, well, well look, before I close, let me, yeah. let me say this. Yeah. Because you mentioned uh, before we started the interview that you, you're living in Atlanta now. Yes. <clears throat> so understand Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta was the base of Dr. King. Atlanta is uh, the base for uh, black education. Uh, you've got Morehouse, you've got Spelman, you've got, you got the, the whole complex of black colleges there in Atlanta. So Atlanta, uh, Atlanta has the capacity to become the heart and soul of a new black consciousness. But the reality is, I saw a brother post something on Instagram recently where he talked about the ratchetness mm -hmm. of Atlanta. Uh, they used to have the, what was it, the Freak Fest? Freak Nick. Freak Nick, all right? So all of these things, are created, are designed specifically to undermine the potential of black people in a place which was the heart and soul of black people. So we're still fighting a war. It's, um, it's a spiritual war, it's a mental war, it's a cultural war. We're still fighting these wars, and Atlanta is a new battleground right now. There are things happening in Atlanta that are undermining the political, cultural, uh, and spiritual progress that that city was known for for decades. Atlanta is under attack right now. And I would encourage, and just as every other major urban center in the United States is under attack. So I would encourage folk listening to, to uh, this broadcast to take some time and think not only about what you eat, to think about what you think, to think about what you listen to, to think about what you read, and make a conscious choice to read material that is going to affirm your cultural identity and embrace those things that affirm your humanity and provide you with the tools, the mental, uh, the emotional, and spiritual tools that will allow you to manifest your power. That is what life is all about. And if you aren't doing those things, then you really are living. Mm. So thank you for this opportunity to talk, my brother. Thank Appreciate you. you. Hope we can do it again. We will do it again, yes, for sir. sure. It's a pleasure. All right. Catch y'all on the next episode of Young, Black, and Vegan.